We, the United States, have never put a price on carbon. We have not, we have not laid the premise for trading in emissions on a national basis, never mind on an international basis. And the reason that I think uh, we can't let the best be the enemy of the good and say that the Kerry Lieberman bill just isn't good enough or it's imperfect in various ways is because it's all we've got. This is At Brookings, a weekly in-depth look at the issues behind the news. This week, the ethics and politics of global warming. With a massive oil leak encroaching on life and livelihoods in the Gulf and newly proposed legislation on climate change being teed up for debate in the Senate, the decibel level on curtailing carbon emissions is heating up. Brookings President Strove Talbot has co-authored a new book on reducing greenhouse gases, Fast Forward, Ethics and Politics in the Age of Global Warming. He says all indicators show that the time is ripe for decisive action on the issue. Strobe, you and Bill Antholis have just written a book on the politics and ethics of climate change, where you urge certain legislative action to help us get a handle on our carbon emissions. Global warming has been going on for 200 years. The temperature of the Earth has been rising for 100 years. We have to get a handle on it now. And that means, in the first instance, that the United States, as the largest emitter of uh, greenhouse gases on a cumulative basis, has to put a price on carbon emissions and start transitioning from a high carbon economy to a low carbon or no carbon economy. And that's what this bill is going to begin to do. So what will it take for our lawmakers to really enact a good piece of legislation on climate change? This has to have bipartisan support. That's only going to happen if Republicans are prepared to set aside their just say no policy where Pres uh, President Obama's initiatives are concerned and say this is something we have to say yes to. And by the way, nobody has been a more eloquent spokesman for that kind of bipartisanship, or I think he would say enlightened partisanship on the part of the Republicans, than Lindsey Graham. Strobe, your book suggests that the United Nations isn't moving fast enough in getting nations to agree on a, a binding treaty for climate change. Is that right? We do not think that the United Nations, after 20 years of trying, has proved itself up to the task of getting the job done quickly. So what we propose as not so much an alternative to the UN, but as a major second track where progress can be made a lot more quickly on fast forward, that's the reason for the title, would be to have f what we call the big four. The United States, European Union, which, could, which consists of 27 countries that are coordinating their climate policies, China, and India, those big four account for the lion's share of the emissions, the lion's share of the population of the planet, the lion's share of the political will, we hope, to get a handle on the problem. And if they can coordinate their policies in some way, that'll bring other countries along. Strobe, you basically say that uh, these countries, India, China, the U.S., and the European Union, need to self-regulate. But that doesn't seem like it would always work. Some kind of offset for the so-called developing world. And China and India, of course, the largest, but South Africa and Brazil and a lot of other countries are important to that. They're going to have to be cut some slack. The uh, requirement, though, is that they not be let off scot-free. There can't be a total exemption. And I think one of the few <laughs> good things that happened at the Copenhagen summit at the end of 2009 was that there was some movement on the part of the developing world, and particularly China and India, in the direction of accepting the principle. They didn't do it in a kind of legally binding way, but to accept the principle that they're going to have to set some targets of their own. Strobe, you make uh, what I thought was a very chilling statement in your book saying that our generation, or this generation, is the last generation that can really get a handle on climate change. What do you mean by that? We're the last generation that can do something about it in the following sense. We have a window, and there is debate about this. It could be five years, it could be 10 years. It's probably not much more than 10 years, where we have to, to use a favorite Washington phrase and a favorite Brookings phrase, bend the curve. We have to bend the curve. That is a huge challenge, and the, the uh, part of that curve that we can affect through policies now is basically between uh, now and five to ten years from now, because if we miss that window, the curve will probably be unbendable. Is it fair to say 
that um, addressing climate change is a matter of ethics, it's practical, and it's a means to our survival. We're in a different situation now. We're in a unique and unprecedented situation. We don't just owe our progeny, our offspring, uh, responsibility of a kind of generalized nature. We owe them something of a very specific nature, which is to do something about uh, carbon emissions now so that the, the uh, climate and the environment are not so badly uh, diminished and so much less hospitable that they'll have a lousy world to live in. Strobe, thank you so much for your time here today. Delighted to be with you, Gigi. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you again next week. I'm Gigi Hinton. At Brookings is produced by the Brookings Institution. To learn more about the issues discussed on At Brookings, visit our website at brookings.edu.